Senator Cogdill. Thank you very much. I uh, wanted to ask a couple of questions of the LAO and then uh, finance can join in on this. But um, the comments have been made recently relating to uh, spending and how in reality, at least according to Mr. Lockyer, it's not out of control that we've actually stayed within a, a very modest limit of growth. Um, but and going back to something that uh, Senator uh, Flores mentioned, I came in the legislature a couple of years later uh, but in the year 2000 is when we had the $12 billion surplus, and then since then there have been a couple of times. That one, was, I recall, was driven by the dot-com uh, phenomenon, and then we had, of course, the real estate uh, boom. But I guess the question I wanted to ask as it relates to spending and, and as we track it through time, uh, if either one of your offices have done an analysis to tell us if we went back to the year 2000, and if we had a real spending cap in place similar to what has been um, proposed by both Republicans in the Assembly and the Senate, what would our situation look like today? Would there be money in the bank, or uh, would we still have a deficit, and if so, uh, how large? And my second question is, we were told uh, when we were working on the 2006-2007 budget, uh, and if you remember, that was another one of those years that we went to quite a while before we, we got a solution. In fact, it ended up in the Senate for an extra 30 days before we could get it done. And we were told from a number of folks, certainly the governor's office and, and others, that uh, the budget that was before us that came over from the assembly uh, was as lean as we could get. There was absolutely no way we could make any further reductions in spending. And as I think you all know, at the end of the day before that budget was signed, there was another $700 million negotiated in spending reductions. And then within the next year, we're back into a special session and the governor has put forward uh, what many consider to be a draconian budget relating to the cuts that he put on the table then. Um, and now we're being told by the LAO's office and, and others that we can't solve this problem with cuts alone. So my question is, uh, given that premise, uh, and given the fact that uh, I think everybody in this room acknowledges that it looks like our economy is going to continue to deteriorate, are we saying that even then with the revenue increases that you're all projecting that this legislature should approve, that odds are we'll have to go back again within a very short period of time and once again raise taxes on the people of this state when, as acknowledged, we rank near the the upper uh, percentile certainly relating to the taxes that Californians currently pay. And do you have an opinion as to how do we do that with a straight face when Californians currently get 78 cents out of every dollar they send to the federal government, that over 35,000 of uh, the folks in our prisons are undocumented that are not or should not be the responsibility of the taxpayers of the state of California? How do we go back to them and say, you're already paying more than your fair share as an American uh, but in order to solve your problem, you've got to dig even deeper because we've cut absolutely every bit of waste, fraud, and abuse out of this budget. If I may, Senator Collins, Sen uh, the minority leader gets a whole lot of deference um, in in uh, asking a question with a with a longer preamble. But for the other members, no more speeches. No more speeches. Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead, Senator. Let me. Uh, you ask a lot of questions. Let me respond to as many as I can. Uh, We've done so many drills, I don't know if we've gone back to 2000 and done the, what you asked for if we had a spending cap in place. Let me just say that generally speaking, if we had the provisions of Proposition 58 or a spending cap in place in past years, that would have taken the edge off some of the good years by putting money into reserve, either through this, that provision or on a restraint in our ability to spend beyond some cap level, we would have been in much better position. There's no question about that. Part of our problem is that we have spent more than we should have during good years, and then we've <coughs> tried to, in effect, defer or borrow a way out to maintain those higher level of spending. So I don't think there's any question about that. Part of the problem with, uh, with Proposition 58, though, is it went into effect in 2004, and we haven't had the kind of good times to build up the reserve to see if it works well enough. We now have a potential balanced budget measure that will go on the ballot that would limit the ability to access the reserve. It does toughen up the provisions of Proposition 58. And I think in the future, that could make a big difference by taking, again, those peaks off of spending. But it won't help us in the near term. We've gotten ourselves into a situation where I just don't know how you quite close that 
on the spending side alone. Assemblymember uh, Gilmore. Could, could I add? I, yeah. Me, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Senator. If I, uh, Madam Speaker, if I could add, it's kind of hard to see you here around the little corner. But, uh, <laughs> the uh, uh, you mentioned our general tax situation, and, and uh, I wouldn't want to say we don't have a spending problem. I think we have a spending and a revenue problem, both. But one of the unique, almost unique things about California is that the state picks up the costs of K-12 education to a greater extent than most states do. And because of that, when you aggregate all of our taxes, including local property taxes, we really fall down about a third among the states from the top. Uh, so there's a lot higher than us and many lower than us, but largely because of that. It's been a few years since I worked these numbers, so, uh, but I think the basic idea is clear. If you take the school dollar and disaggregate between local and state resources and then rank the 50 states, as a state, we're like fourth or fifth in terms of the proportion, the ratio that comes from state, and local dollar like 45th. And reverse, you know, if local dollars small, state dollars big. That really skews all of our numbers in a substantial way because of our commitment to uh, K-12 schools that the state is picking up. Uh, Senator, on your question about the taxes, clearly our office didn't put that, that, out that uh, our proposals to increase revenues slightly or casually. Um, back in February when the state had a significant budget problem, we did not recommend that the legislature increase, increase tax rates. We relied on other provisions, expenditure reductions, some borrowing and other measures because of the concerns that you, know, you raised in your comments. I think we've just got at the point where we just don't see how you can get from where you need to be from where you are right now with at least some revenue increases of the duration that the governor has proposed, which was three years. Sen Senator, can I also um, answer your question? I think you asked me to address it as well. On the spending cap question, I don't have it from 2000, but I have it from 97-98. Um, and, if, and if we had had uh, a cap that consisted of the California CPI and the growth in population and limited spending to that amount, um, we would currently in, in this current year, 90 or 8, 9, be spending 92 um, billion, 762 million with that adjustment from back, from, from back then. Now, in our special uh, session uh, proposal, we would be spending 98.9. Now, that was the November proposal because of the inability to address that in November. Now, that number is up 99.6, so that's just the erosion of those savings. Um, and so that's substantially higher than a spending cap would have had. But you must remember, and, and this is always a difficult one to explain, the uh, vehicle license fee um, tax cut was a tax cut of a local revenue, and it was a spending increase for the state. So that's worth about 4.3. So if that, that was part of that spending increase, and I think it's fair to not really think of it as a spending increase, but as a tax reduction. So if you make that adjustment, we'd still be a little bit high relative to where we were in 97, 98. On your point of raising, that is high in spending. So that would certainly argue for even more spending cuts. I think, however, you're going to get your opportunity for even more spending cuts when we propose our Jan 10 budget, because as I said earlier, these numbers will only get worse. Uh, I don't say that with great relish, but I do say it with great certainty. And so, um, yes, there will be a second bite at the apple in January out of necessity. What that is, I can't say. We're working with the governor this week to try to get those decisions wrapped up and those numbers finalized. Uh, but the important thing is that in many years, people have thought, well, why, why vote twice on something like this? Let's just wait and see what the final number is. The problem that this panel, I think, has pretty ably demonstrated is that waiting is itself a huge problem and causes the problem when you get to it, when you finally solve it, to be even harder to solve. Finally, Assemblymember Gilmore. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is uh, directed to Mr. Genest as well uh, about the importance of job creation in the Golden State. The federal unemployment rate uh, currently is 6.7, but California's unemployment rate is 20 percent higher at 8.2 percent, 
In the Central Valley, numbers are even worse. In my home county, in Kings County, the rate is 10.9 percent unemployment. The remaining three counties in my district, Tulare, Fresno, and Kern County, that unemployment rate is a staggering 9.9 to 11.8 percent. Put this in real terms, the number of people unemployed in California was 1,526,000, up 95,000 over the month, and up 487,000 compared with October of last year. My question is this, how important is job creation to the governor's economic recovery plan, and is job creation essential to putting the budget in balance? Thank you. Thank you. Well, as, as you know, the governor has made it a priority uh, to talk about stimulating the economy in the context of his um, budget plan and, and this special session, uh, and I think there are two. Um, so it is definitely important. I think it might be worthwhile thinking about some of those numbers, however, as to what we would do about it. There's sort of two things. There's things that we do in the budget, and by definition, anything we do in a bad budget is going to make those numbers worse. If we, for example, cut to solve the entire, if we do nothing but cuts, that will result in more unemployment. If we do nothing but taxes, that will clearly result in more unemployment because raising taxes in a recession is a really bad thing to do. Uh, we are going to be doing some really bad things in this session because we have to. It's, while it may be uh, bad policy from an economic perspective, it is, in my opinion, unavoidable from a realist perspective. Uh, however, the impact, as the Treasurer said, and I'd like to turn the rest of this answer over to the Treasurer because it was his numbers, the impact of the continuing budget crisis um, on our ability to continue with infrastructure projects is just about as bad as the impact uh, of the tax increases that we are proposing um, would be. So I think I'd like to let the Treasurer just uh, talk about that a bit. May I? Uh, yeah, I would just reemphasize the to take a look at the school construction projects that won't occur, the highway projects, inner city rail, and other things that in nine days our panel is, that I chair is confronted with the uh, likely obligation to just <coughs> turn off that financing spigot. Uh, it can get started up again when there's a balanced budget and we can go back to markets hopefully and reborrow at reasonable rates to replenish those funds and get the infrastructure spending. But in the meantime, there's literally tens of thousands of jobs that uh, won't get uh, created or continued. Some projects, it will vary, may lose federal match. Some, if they're bumping into a deadline, may have to start an EIR project over again. It, it, there's a myriad of projects and lots of complications associated uh, with each. Um, Assemblyman, you're absolutely right that job creation and economic stimulation should be part of what you're uh, thinking about and trying to do. Uh, most of us have uh, found that it's very difficult to see the uh, outcome results that uh, somehow match the uh, philosophies and, that get expressed and uh, that disciplined work would be helpful. Uh, but uh, it, it, I, I would absolutely agree that um, in certainly the long term there needs to be uh, sensitivity to job creation in the state. Uh, with respect to tax policies, almost every economist thinks that it's federal tax policy that's relevant, not very much state with respect to uh, inducing investment. Uh, and we're, of course, thinking there's going to be a lot happening in that area with the new uh, federal administration. Um, I know. Uh, Mr. Cogdell mentioned that, in fact, when I think the first year of Clinton's presidency, we got 98 cents back from the federal government of every dollar we sent to Washington, D.C., and at least the most recent numbers I've heard were 78 cents back. It's a substantial amount less. The feds are talking about perhaps 
expanding federal commitments to uh, Medicaid, to uh, medical care for folks, and you know, while the, someone gets that care, it's really the medical community providers that wind up with the, the financing. California gets 50 cents for every of every dollar from the feds. That, or that is, there's an equal match, 50-50 with the feds. But the national median for reimbursement to states for Medicare is 57, 57%. If California and other states like us could come up to the national median, some states, by the way, are close to 80% reimbursement from the feds. It seems to me it's something that our Washington friends should be working on. It's a couple of billion dollars if we average up to the national median for Medicaid. And that, that's not going to happen quickly, and no one should work it into current budget scores, but it is something we ought to all be working on. Thank you. Senator Alquist at Assemblymember Solario's desk. Thank you very much. <clears throat> My eight and a half second overlay to the question to Mr. Taylor and anyone else who would like to answer it is, this is the worst and most complex budget deficit this state has seen in over 40 years. In February, we will have $882 million cash on hand, and that's out of a $103 billion general fund budget. And uh, if we don't accept the December session proposals, in the budget year 2009-10, we will have a deficit of $25.2 billion. So my question is, why is it so important that we act in this current year, which is almost over, and what does it mean in crafting the budget for next year that we step up to the plate, make good decisions, and how does that affect both the spending side and uh, the revenue side, the tax increase side of what we would have to do next year versus this year? Let me just reiterate some things that I said in my comments. If you act now, you can put in place whatever spending reductions you adopt, whatever revenue increases you adopt, and they can go into effect within the next month or so. And that can generate, in some cases, a half a year of savings. And if you don't, what you're doing is, in effect, taking those solutions and requiring them to be addressed in the 910 budget. And you've just kind of compounded the problem that you have going into 910. Is the mic on? My real question, though, was in terms of the revenue side. What are we re really looking at? And maybe we're not able to answer this today. But what are we really looking at in terms of any tax increases now versus not doing that and the magnitude exponentially of having to do that next year? Because I, for one, think you know, we have to cut, but we also have to have some new money coming in. And the economy is not going to help us for quite a while. Well, again, the administration had, um, in the current year, had about half and half. So of, of their solutions, which they, again, said have eroded in their uh, benefit to the state, but they had about four and a half billion of each. So if you don't uh, start those revenue increases, it just means you have to find a similar amount of either increases in the next year or additional expenditure reduction. <coughs> Pardon me? Absolutely. Next year. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, before I call on the next person, I just want to do a time check. It's 4.30. We want to go 30 more minutes. We have eight assembly members wanting to ask questions, five senators. So can I ask you to please get to the question quickly, assembly member Luke. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, when the governor called a special session, he also included two additional topics, a mortgage reform and foreclosure prevention. California has record levels of foreclosures, questions for Controller Chung, um, if you could talk about uh, foreclosures and its effect on the budgeting economy. Absolutely. Thank you, uh, Assembly Member. Uh, it is clear at this particular juncture uh, in the economy that we need to build a measure of stability. 
into the volatile elements of the economy. Uh, what is taking place, as many of us are well aware, uh, when we pulled out of the recession at the beginning portion of this decade, it was in fact real estate that helped California. The most volatile portions of the income stream uh, tied to the personal income tax, which is the largest source of state revenues, is capital gains. Uh, the major components of that are either public equities or real estate. Uh, and in fact, if you think about uh, the impact, not to a, just an immediate household, but how it has an impact upon state, we had significant job creation for, uh, for the fastest areas of employment growth in California uh, at the beginning of the decade were real estate agents, mortgage bankers and brokers, construction contract, co contractors, and then fourth related architects and engineers. So it added to all three major revenue streams uh, that we all uh, identify personal income taxes, corporate taxes, and the transactional taxes, most of us knowing it as the sales tax. Uh, so if we can build some type of basing, or as common parlance is, uh, bottoming of that stability, uh, I know you're introducing, you have introduced legislation which I think would assist us to a significant degree uh, that would help to start to create a bottom. What we don't have in the market today is we don't understand what the basing or bottoming is taking place in regards to the mortgage market. Now that has been magnified because we have significant unemployment issues in the state of California. On national and global issues, we have liquidity, solvency uh, issues. Uh, we have uh, a lowering of the principal commodity uh, oil, uh, so that is not as much of a factor as it was in the second quarter of this year. Uh, so I would strongly uh, encourage that type of action that the governor and you have forwarded in regards to tr create a market. Uh, and also it helps stabilize. Once people know that they are going to be in a house, then they can decide what they're going to do. They have to address additional issues that are rising in the economy, including personal credit card debt, the lack of purchases in t regards to automobiles. Uh, but then if they know that they've uh, modified the language of their loan, they can start to perhaps add to their house, you know, buy some paint, uh, buy some furniture, and that will have a, uh, a positive effect uh, net to the California and national economy. Thank you. Senator Dutton. Get the mic there, please. Thank you. Excuse me, you're at Mr. Nielsen's desk? Yes, I am. There you go. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Forbes magazine happens to disagree with the where California ranks as far as attracting businesses. They actually rank us down in the low 40s. As a matter of fact, almost dead last as being a state that is, uh, has an attractive <coughs> regulatory climate with regards to businesses who are looking to expand or invest or, or take, take a look at locations. So you might, I'll get that information for you and, and share that with you, but that is a real, that is a real problem. Uh, however, with regards to taxation, uh, do you think there's any level of taxation that affects the economy and, and do you believe that business decisions will be affected by California's tax climate? You made the comment about the feds, but there are other states that are beating us as far as getting some new business like Mississippi did with Toyota. Uh, and so I'd be curious if any of you feel that the tax climate of California does not uh, have a, a deterrent uh, with that. Uh, also, with regards to your uh, expenditures, and this is really for the LEO and Department of Finance, based on your expenditure projections, which programs are going to be the major cost drivers in the near future? And do you plan to uh, uh, put forth any type of uh, cost control uh, proposals so that we can make sure that these programs uh, don't have a, don't run away with cost? And also, I'm kind of curious with the given uh, recent stock market turmoil. Uh, and specifically regarding employee compensation and pensions, uh, what are the budgetary risks uh, with regards to unfunded liabilities uh, for retiree health and pension programs? <laughs> and is there any kind of reforms that the administration is proposing or anybody else has thoughts on that we ought to consider now and also N next budget? Nine, 90 seconds to answer those five questions, right? Uh. It's okay. If you can be brief, because we do have other questions, and if you can focus most of the answer on, again, what we, what we need to deal with uh, over the next uh, 30 days, we'd appreciate it. Well, let, let me start very quickly. Um, taxes do matter. Uh, as the Treasurer said, they don't matter as much as the Feds, 
but they do matter, and the cumulative effect, along with a lot of other factors, can make a difference. I don't think there's any question about that. As far as expenditure growth, we're projecting that the fastest growing programs on, in terms of general fund will be IHSS, SSISSP, and Medi-Cal, and, and debt service because of the spate of new bonds that have been approved by the voters. Those would be the fastest growing areas over the next four or five years. And um, we, we essentially ag agree with that. I think we should also note that over the last 10 years, um, Proposition 98 has not grown very fast at all, about 2.6 percent if you take out some of the effects of the various property tax uh, shifts that have occurred, uh, 2.6 percent annual growth. However, um, part of that is because of the reductions that we are allowed to take in Proposition 98 in a test three year, and those build up maintenance factors. So paying off that maintenance factor 